Hi, welcome to Get Used to It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, your hostess, uh, through these uh, many uh, journeys that we've taken together. And today I have a show slightly different from the ones that we've done in the past, uh, and I hope of, uh, of interest. Uh, we've all been pretty horrified by some of the headlines and some of the images that we've seen recently about our treatment of prisoners in Iraq. And I was very stunned, actually, by some of the sort of sexual connotations of it, uh, the sexual humiliation issue. And at the same time, uh, here in California, I serve on the select committee about California's prisons. And we've been hearing a great deal of testimony about what goes on in California's prisons, also with this sort of sense of sexual shame, uh, homophobia, but also sometimes homoeroticism. So in a show that deals with issues of interest or kind of by or about gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgender community, this is out of the ordinary because this treatment is not really about homosexual behavior or gay people necessarily. And I have two wonderful guests with me today to explore uh, these issues, um, a great deal to talk about. Uh, Lara Stemple, who is the executive director of Stop Prisoner Rape. Welcome, Lara. Thank you. Very good to have you here. Thank you. And T.J. Parcell, who is a uh, civil rights activist around issues of prisoner rape and himself a survivor of in-prison rape. Uh, well, you kind of heard my introduction, mm -hmm. and uh, people in America are not paying much attention to the plight of people in prisons. They often have attitudes about, well, they did something wrong, they're in prison, we'll put them in there and forget about them. Occasionally we hear about guard misbehavior or something a lot of people don't really want to hear about. And then suddenly we see these images from an entirely other country where Americans are doing these horrible things and we see these images and the images themselves are disturbing for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them, as I said, is this sort of lingering feeling that there's sexual humiliation is uh, among the deepest kinds. So tell me a little about your organization, the uh, issues that you deal with, and really anything else you want to say about it. Sure, sure. Well, I think you're right that this is an incredibly timely issue, and it is an important one to discuss. And I think that what has happened in Iraq has, has brought this issue to the fore. Our organization has been around for more than 20 years. It's called Stop Prisoner Rape. It's a national human rights organization, and we work against sexual violence in prisons, jails, and immigration detention, and we're based in Los Angeles. I think that one of the things that we're learning from Iraq is that when people are confronted with the reality of of sexual abuse and humiliation, they, they think it's wrong. Um, and I think that there's broad agreement on that. Um, the problem has been with the situation for U.S. prisoners is it's just been ignored for far too long. Um, it's something that has just been taken as part of the punishment, um, seen as seen as uh, seen as as acceptable. Um, but it is something that once people stop and think about and when they hear the the real human consequences uh, behind the abuse, then they start to think, well maybe we should take this seriously. Uh, unfortunately we've all heard the tasteless jokes on late night television um, about, mm -hmm. you know, don't drop the soap, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And while I think we as a society have moved forward to a point where we don't joke about women being raped outside of prison, for some reason it's still socially acceptable to joke about people being raped inside of prison. So part of what we're trying to do is, is, uh, is to change that. Well, I think people have a really difficult time. I mean, what experience do people really have with prisons unless they've been in one, mm -hmm. and they don't get much real information from the media. Mm -hmm. So I think the first question would be how prevalent is rape in the prisons? And then let's talk about other forms of sexual violence or humiliation. Sure. Well, uh, for men in prison, studies have shown, and th these are university-led studies. Um, Cindy Struckman Johnson is a researcher at the University of South Dakota, and her research has shown that as many as one in five male prisoners has experienced some kind of a pressured or forced sex incident, and as many as one in ten has been forcibly raped. Uh, male inmates tend to be abused by other inmates, although there are situations of, of men being abused by uh, male and female staff. 
women are less likely to be abused uh, by other inmates and more likely to be abused by staff. And the rates for women really vary among facilities uh, depending on the types of prevention programs that are in place. But in, in the very worst facilities, we've seen that um, as many as one in four women in prison has experienced some type of a pressured or forced sex incident. Well, in terms of um, uh, men on men, mm -hmm. I think the, the obviously people say, I don't want to think about that, I don't want to even know about that. Mm -hmm. But the, the prison population, and I'm sure TJ will also uh, talk more about this, um, it, it's really not necessarily about being gay. I mean, there must be a great deal of sexual activity in prisons, mm -hmm. uh, forced or coerced. Uh, or, you know, perhaps uh, survival uh, sex, I guess we would mm -hmm. call it, out on the street, uh, that even though it is same sex, it's really not about gay people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think that's right. The dynamics that, that we see in prison are very different, um, and there is a, a sort of pattern that plays out in terms of the, the subculture of prisons. So what we see in terms of male inmate on inmate rape is that the person who is is the abuser usually maintains a heterosexual identity both internally and in terms of the way he's responded to by other people within the prison. So uh, even though he's the one that's initiating the technically homosexual interaction, he maintains a straight identity and he tends to feminize his victims. So often what we see are perpetrators using derogatory um, words that are normally used for women. They'll use those words to describe the victims and the victims take on a submissive or feminized identity. Um, and in terms of, of who the victims are, the, the research is quite clear on the fact that, um, that, that those who are victims, it's, it's quite easy to predict. So anyone who is um, inexperienced in the ways of prison life, a first-time offender, um, someone who's not gang-affiliated, smaller, weaker, bookish, that type of thing, those, those folks are, are likely to be targeted. And as far as gay inmates go, the, the data is somewhat limited, but one study revealed that um, gay male inmates were actually four times as likely to be victimized um, in this way than uh, heterosexual inmates. So. I think there's a myth out there that um, some, some of the terms, in fact, are quite misleading, like um, you know, homosexual predators or, or um, you know, gay rape. It's, it's not, those terms are, are somewhat misleading um, when the reality is that um, gay men in prison are often victimized and the, the ones who are perpetrating the rape are heterosexual. Well, the other thing that struck me about um, Iraq, now I, I'm not trying to really say that these are the same thing, but I was just sort of amazed at how the thought went from sexual humiliation of these prisoners in Iraq mm -hmm. to this sexual humiliation perhaps in another way or maybe not mm -hmm. uh, in American prisons but one of the things that I noticed as well in reading about the humiliation of Iraqi prisoners was how they themselves were made to feel ashamed by what they were forced to do by the guards mm -hmm. um, because that's exploiting their homophobia in mm -hmm. a way. I, it, do you see it that way? I do see it that way. I think the link is quite clear. Um, I think it's, it is an example in a lot of ways of the U.S. exporting its poison. And some of the things that have been going on here for a long time are what we are seeing in Iraq. So, um, you know, the sheriff in Arizona quite openly forced male inmates to wear women's pink underwear as a way to humiliate and degrade them. Um, forced nudity, forced strip searches, that kind of thing are, are very common within prisons and not just for security purposes. They've been used for retaliatory purposes or punishment purposes. Um, I think we all know about the Abner Louima case where he was sodomized by police officers uh, in a New York station house. And that type of, of sexual brutality is, I think, uniquely used to humiliate victims and to shame them into to compliance or into silence. Um, and, and seeing that kind of thing in Iraq is, I think, is, is very familiar. Well, and also chaining all of the men together mm -hmm. while naked so that they were forced to touch each other in a way that they may not have uh, you know, really wanted to or uh, might have quite objected to. I think you're right, and I think that there is a current of homophobia that's underlying all of that. And I think that that's the same kind of homophobia that we see in a lot of U.S. prisons. There's a real 
um, kind of a macho attitude and a belief on the part of a number of corrections officers that if a victim is gay, he must have somehow secretly wanted it. Mm. Um, there's even denial by some staff that a man could, e a man could even be raped unless he was somehow um, himself wanting it or somehow complicit. Well, and it's not too long ago we had exactly, we found exactly that same attitude about women. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. mean, I remember the Italian judge that because a woman was wearing a pair of jeans, mm -hmm. Um, de decided officially that she could not have been raped mm -hmm. because she would have had to help her attack her, mm -hmm. uh, take off her clothes, mm -hmm. and which is why the women in the United States, many of us wear jeans on a particular mm -hmm. day each right. year yeah, to great. commemorate that. But the idea that you know you can't be raped, you must have liked it, is a very convenient way for a rapist to get away with it. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. I think that with this issue of sexual violence in prison, we are in many ways where the women's rights movement was a number of decades ago in terms of, you know, first there's the denial that it's a problem, second there's, you know, blaming the victim and, and just really kind of bringing it out into the open and, um, you know, treating it like, treating it as a serious abuse, as a serious human rights abuse, which is is what it is, and that's one of the reasons that our organization has described this as torture for mm -hmm. for a number of years, and it's uh, it's has been a much less challenging case to make actually now that people are seeing the abuses happening abroad and there's an instant recognition of things that happen internationally as being a form of torture but our argument is that torture can and does happen in the United States it meets the definition of torture under international law and the United States has ratified the convention against torture so there's every reason to to treat this as as just uh, as what it is which is a is a, a very a serious human rights abuse of the highest order I would argue I thought there was another interesting connection uh, yesterday, um, for those of you watching this uh, some other time, yesterday would be June 3rd, 2004, in the Los Angeles Times, I think on the ninth page of the first section, there was just a tiny article sort of buried mm -hmm. about four different former prison officials from four different states who had been hired by John Ashcroft's Justice Department to be private contractors about interrogation and prison issues in Iraq. Each one of them had been fired from their job for their alleged complicity in the rape of women by guards in their various prisons, all four of them. Um, that I think was also mind-boggling, but I, I think that this issue of, you know, of dominance, whether it's man-on-man -man or man-on-woman, and as you say there may not be as many uh, issues about women on women. We haven't, I haven't seen the study about it. I never say never about any of this stuff. Uh, but that was just stunning to me. I don't know if you saw the article. Yes, I did. And I, I, it wasn't stunning to me. <laughs> um, uh, you know, we have seen that in the U.S. as a pattern. We recently investigated the Ohio Reformatory for Women, which, uh, you know, we were hearing actually from whistleblowers, um, staff members working inside the facility who were saying that women uh, were being sexually abused and that nothing was being done about it. And in fact, the women who were abused were put into um, what they called administrative segregation, but is really solitary confinement in deplorable conditions and put in lockdown for 23 hours a day after reporting a situation of sexual abuse. Mm -hmm. So there was really a climate of, of keeping the women quiet and the whistleblowers who, who um, appeared in a human rights report that we released said that there was really a policy of screw up and move up. So when, when officers were found to have committed custodial sexual misconduct, they were at a maximum shown the door, uh, not prosecuted. At a minimum, they were uh, transferred to another position, and often it was a better position. Mm -hmm. So there have been situations of people being dismissed or fired for sexual misconduct, and then they are able to get work in other facilities. And this is, this is a real problem, because I do think that there are a number of corrections officers who take a lot of pride in their jobs, and they have high standards of professionalism. And um, those who are, who are perpetrators of abuse are too often being allowed to get away with it. And I think that's why these, hearing from these courageous whistleblowers who really spoke mm -hmm. out about what was happening was so powerful. Well, TJ, you've, um, I want to thank you very much, come all the way from New York on your own dime to talk about this. And I know you're a national activist on these issues and also, as you described to me, a survivor yourself. Will you talk a little about that and elucidate on some of the themes that we've raised? Sure, sure. And again, thank you for having me. It's, um it's actually an honor to be a, a voice for a community that's um, 
uh, doesn't have much of a voice and hasn't had much of a voice for a long time. Uh, in 1978, I was 17 years old, and um, I, I robbed a photo mat with a toy gun. It was mm -hmm. a stupid prank. It uh, you know, turned serious, and it, it landed me in uh, an adult prison uh, for four and a half to 15 years. Wow. Um, now, I had um, inklings that I was gay, um, I, like most adolescents, um, you know, particularly at that time. You know, right. I, I, I uh, suppressed a lot of those urges, so I was still a virgin. I mean, it, um, but um, within my uh, first 24 hours in uh, general population, some older inmates um, had uh, given me a drink that was spiced with uh, Thorazine, which mm. is a very strong um, uh, sedative tranquilizer, I guess, that was um, prescribed to some mentally ill patients. And, um, and I was raped by uh, three men. Mm. And then the, uh, the, the rape was broken up by a fourth man. And, uh, um, at the end of it, after a long fight, they flipped a coin to see which one of them I would belong to. Uh, for, so from, from that point forward, I belonged to um, a gentleman by the name of Slowdrag, who was doing 15 to 30 for um, aggravated assault. Um, the, uh, uh, my story is a, is a very common one, you know, as, as Laura has, has mentioned, uh, you know, for a young inmate, you know, uh, they're sized up the moment uh, we walk in the door. And um, I think that it's as much about, uh, you know, dominance as it is about uh, sex. And, uh, you know, again, as Lara mentioned, the majority of the, um, well, the perpetrators are men. In prison, there's a, um, there's a hierarchy. And, um, uh, you know, and I think on a very high level, it's there's men and then there's, there's punks. And, um, uh, you know, punks are, are um, those that either you know came in this way, um, in the case of gay inmates, or um, those that are turned out, the expressions that, that's uh, used for raping and uh, you know subjugating someone to a, a sexual um, servitude um, while they're in there. Um, I was transferred about a year later into a medium security uh, prison, so the violence wasn't as great. Um, but uh, my reputation came with me. The, uh, the prison grapevine is, is pretty efficient. And uh, so I was um, you know, forced to, again, find another protective pairing scenario, or I would have been subjected to more rape. And uh, that's, you know, the, the process of being turned out is, is uh, considered irrevocable. Mm -hmm. So once you've been uh, you know, turned out, you, know, you, you need to um, uh, either lock up in solitary confinement, which is as much um, like uh, a punitive segregation. And if you're doing a number of years, that could be um, pretty, pretty maddening. Um, and then for the, uh, the, and then the other thing is to, you know, go into a protective pairing situation. So I think there's a lot of, of um, a protective pairing that is sort of a coerced situation that, that uh, is underreported. So. I, I would say, from my experience, gay men in, in prison, uh, the uh, the forty one percent that was in that one study is, is probably uh, um, a very low number. There must be a great deal of shame that the, the prisoners who are victims feel being put into this situation. It's a good question. I actually think that um, the 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 rape itself isn't uh, as uh, as, as well, actually, as horrible as the rape itself is, I think it's the uh, the events that that follow that is is probably more damaging um, because it just it robs the spirit of of identity in a lot of ways. As you know, Lara was saying, there's a um, there's the emasculation that goes on or the feminization of uh, of um, uh, the inmates. Now, in my case, I was fortunate; I wasn't given a female uh, nickname or. Um, mm you know, was forced to wear a female clothes, but it certainly is a, um, a scenario where um, how I'm viewed is dependent upon who my man is or who, you know, um, is the dominant person in the protective pair. Um, and then the shame and the, 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 and the stigma that, that goes on long afterwards um, uh, for rape victims includes depression, um, uh, suicide, uh, in some cases, uh, drug addiction. Um, in, in my case, I went through, um, you know, a couple of years of, um, of uh, uh, well, actually, I, I bottomed out on, on alcoholism and, and drugs. Um, uh, 
uh, and it was fortunate enough to not only get sober but to get quite a few years of therapy. Um, and always a good thing. Always a good thing. Um, but so uh, there are effects that follow you a after you've served your time and you're out. I mean, I'm assuming there's, I don't want to sound stupid, I know there's effects of having been in prison no matter what. Right. And in a way, I think people say, well, of course, they're supposed to be. I mean, you're supposed to feel shame sure. in prison. But this well, is almost like an extra sentence, isn't it? It is an extra sentence. And I think for gay men in particular, it's uh, uh, one of the things that was very um, hard for me. And I, and I thought I was alone uh, in this. And uh, when I found um, Stop Prisoner Rape and uh, some of their um, uh, stuff that's on their website, website, it was incredibly healing to me because a common thing for gay men is we tend to blame ourselves because of our own internalized homophobia. Um, so, you know, that is part of it, the shame and, uh, you know, that I deserve this and, uh, you know, the fact that you can't talk about it um, uh, or couldn't talk about these things for a long time because then what happens is, you know, uh, the, the, there is a, um, a re-traumatization, I think, that occurs just in terms of how people relate to you. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of triggers the, um, you know, the shame. So what is so your it's a work? long road to, to recovery. Uh, and I'm I sorry. no, you don't listen. I'm, we should interrupt each other. That's why we have okay. two, three cameras. Um, the um, um, what is your work now? I mean, there. It's not really usual that someone would be a survivor of something. Um, it might be more usual to try to, you know, heal and find some therapy and find some help. But a lot of people don't become activists uh, or want to work about this issue. What led you to want to do this? And tell me a little about what your work is now. Sure. Um, it actually, let me, let me say this, it took me years in therapy before I could get to the point to even talk about it with my therapist. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a gradual thing. Uh, so it, it'd give you an indication of how deep uh, uh, seated that that uh, you know shame and stigma was that I was carrying and, and even it's not to about shame about being gay it's really shame about being raped and being treated that way that's right in a way that you didn't choose yourself I that's mean, we exactly can choose right. to be gay that's exactly right um, and, and, it, and it shows up in a, in a variety of different ways I mean even today if there's the slightest sound in the middle of the night I will spring up from my bed uh, with the noise, um, so you know, I'm sure that is rooted in, in mm -hmm. uh, you know those those you know years in my late teens. Um, so um, I'm sorry, I lost. No, the, the work that you're doing now. The, the work that I'm doing now. Um, uh, I actually spent 20 years in the software business mm -hmm. and um, uh, uh, took a, re uh, a sabbatical, or retired two years ago, and I've actually started writing about uh, my experience. So I've been working on a book about that period of time and uh, about, uh, you know, my journey to, to um, uh, I guess, back to sanity, um, if you will, but, uh, uh, and which is what got me in touch with um, SPR. And, and again, it was after years of, of, of working on this stuff that got me to the point where, you know, I, I, I now wanted to write about it because I think it is the kind of thing that needs a human face. Um, you know, there's programs on uh, cable television had a program that uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, glorified it in some ways almost. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, it's riveting, you know, so the, this, this topic, but I, I think that people want to deal with it, they either don't want to deal with it at all, um, it's too much, and they want to just shut down and say, you know, these people broke a contract with society, why should we care? Or to the other extreme, they want to see a, you know, a very dramatic television series or a film about it, and then, you know, once that program's over, forget about it. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, I think that's what uh, motivated me to want to put a human face to it, so that on both extremes, that it's a, um, it's actually, um, in, in a lot of ways, worse than uh, the way it's depicted in some of these very dramatic programs, and uh, because uh, it's so ordinary, or so usual, so or yes. Yeah. Well, I just, to add to, to what TJ is saying about what he's doing, I, he's been an incredibly powerful voice in the movement. Last year we worked to pass a bill in Congress, it was the first ever piece of federal legislation to address rape in prison called mm -hmm. the Prison Rape 
Elimination Act, and we brought uh, seven survivors of prisoner rape and family members to tell their stories on Capitol Hill, and it was the first time uh, that any group of people had talked about their own experiences with prisoner rape. And TJ, I actually asked him to go first, so he was the first one to, to do this very public thing. I asked him to go first because I knew he would be so powerful. Um, and he's testified at New York City Hall and um, has been in various news accounts. And I think that, that bringing survivors into the process is, is absolutely essential for the reasons that you say, putting a human face on it. It's, it's so easy for us as a society to think of prisoners as being over there. They've been sent away. They're no longer with us, no longer a part of our community. And the reality is that even though there are two million people uh, incarcerated in prison at any given time, there are as many as 11 million people coming in and out um, in a year. So it's really a revolving door. And prisoners are a part of our communities. And the things that happen to them there um, stay with them. I think, too, the other, the other point is for those um, people that would prefer not to think about it or you know, say, well, you know, it's these criminals and uh, you know, they knew what they were getting into um, and should have stayed out of jail. Um, the image that one would often think about is these violent criminals, these predators that, uh, uh, that we, you'd cross the street that we're afraid of, that we lock our doors over. And, uh, uh, but the reality is those are the, that image is you, typically the ones that are the perpetrators of rape. The reality is the ones that are the victims of rape are often, uh, you know, as, as Laura said, they're, they're you know, they are at-risk youth, mm -hmm. you know, the kids that uh, do stupid things like, you know, robbing a photo mat with a toy gun. Well, and of course in California, between three strikes and what we hear called Prop 21, which uh, set up a way in which uh, children as young as 14 will be tried as adults and sent mm -hmm. to adult facilities because they've committed certain crimes, it exacerbates exactly. uh, the whole issue and frankly, you know, it uh, makes it uh, prob a probability that this will happen to them. That's but right. No there is, there is some data, sorry, just a quick statistic. Um, youth sent to adult facilities are five times as likely to be victims of sexual assault as youth who are sent to juvenile facilities. And with this increasing tendency to try juveniles as adults, it's a real problem. Yeah, we have over 100,000 teenagers in adult prisons in this country. And, it, and it really, I mean, I, I made the point about the nonviolent offenders or, you know, but it really, it doesn't matter what the crime is. No one deserves to be raped. Rape should never be part of the punishment. And the way in which it is um, sort of just, you know, dismissed or not addressed is, is uh, I think, just as criminal. Well, the thing I want to underscore, too, and then, uh, uh, you know, another set of things to explore as well, but your, uh, your indication, and I want to underscore it, that people think when there's rape in prison it's homosexual rape or homosexual acts and what I heard you say is nothing could really be further from the truth because it's not about two gay men deciding that's what they want to do but rather a man who identifies as straight and continues to identify as straight but a, a, a powerful person taking power over another uh, perpetrates this rape and still maintains that he's straight. He's simply treating someone in a way that objectifies them or makes them less. Well, yeah, That's it has right. as much to do with the uh, the uh, the role that they play sexually. As long as uh, the uh, the man is not in a in a receiving passive role, um, uh, then his his manhood is still considered intact. It's it's really stereotypical gender domination. It's, it's not, you know, in that sense, if, if by gender we mean, uh, you know, the implication of, of, of power, um, you know, the power that one has over another, it's really uh, quite traditional in that sense. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't realize. You know, the other thing that interests me is the, um, the depth of our own identity about sex and sexuality. And how, um, I, I, I heard a prisoner who was a victim of rape say he would have rather been beaten every day. Mm -hmm. Because you can steel yourself in some ways against violence. It hurts, it's scary, it's terrible, you could die. But that's external to you. There's something so internal about your own sexual behavior or um, sexuality. Do you, mm -hmm. do, you, do you think that's the case? It seems like a more humiliating or violent act 
than just beating you up every day. I think that's definitely true. I think that that's why the, the levels of psychological trauma are so severe. TJ mentioned several of them, you know, substance abuse, suicide, et cetera. Post-traumatic stress disorder is alarmingly common for people who have undergone this ordeal. Um, you know, if a lot of people are, are able in their lives, if they've been traumatized, to avoid the setting where the trauma has taken place. So if you were near the Twin Towers on September 11th, you might not go back to that part of New York City for a number of years so as to avoid the trauma. But when you're being raped in prison, you really can't avoid the, the setting. And, and sometimes the abuse spans for quite a long time. One of the other wonderful survivors that we work with is a man called Roderick Johnson. And he was a, a young Navy veteran, a gay man who was sentenced to prison for violating his parole, bouncing a $300 check. And he was literally held captive by Texas prison gangs and was forced into sexual slavery. He was rented out for four sex acts for five and ten dollars. Um, per act and was raped almost every single day for 180 days and the ACLU has brought suit on his behalf and so forth but a, a, a level of abuse that's so severe that spans for such a long period of time is it's really almost unimaginable to believe that someone can first of all endure that and live through it and then to go on um, and speak out about it and, and become involved um, as an activist in the way that TJ has is, is Amazing! It's an amazing testament to the human spirit. I think. Well, in in in, in Roderick Johnson's uh, case, he filed seven separate formal grievances, um, and uh, it wasn't until after the lawsuit was filed that he was finally moved into protective custody. And even then, in the lawsuit, the state of Texas um, has maintained that uh, he was engaged in consensual relationships, which is appalling, and it, and it it goes to the the homophobia that that often will will show up among prison administrators because they viewed because Roderick was gay that uh, he obviously must have liked this but the inmates do that as well the inmates view uh, inmates that are gay as uh, a weakness in character that uh, you know the difference between an inmate who has uh, is a man is, is is its heart you know and so the the men that are even the straight uh, uh, victims that are, are turned out uh, it's a weakness in their character and in their 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 courage or their heart that's well, what brings this about so imagine being the recipient of those messages and being subjugated into that role it, it takes quite a while to you know separate that out from mm -hmm. what you tell yourself about mm -hmm. yourself and I also think tying it back to the situation in Iraq, the case of Roderick Johnson is one where the corrections officers were really participating in the sexual humiliation. So, for example, um, Roderick's abusers decided to give him a new name. They named him Coco. Uh, and even the correction staff started calling him that. That became, he was forced to assume a different persona. And they didn't take his complaints of abuse seriously and then even joined in on the taunting. Um, which does harken back to some of what we're seeing internationally. Well, I also thought, I mean, the, to, to uh, continue the, the, this notion of sort of the depth of sexual humiliation and how effective it is to sort of render you non-human or lesser, mm -hmm. uh, it was, to me, it was very interesting that that was sort of the torture of choice in Iraq, mm -hmm. very much as it is here, although you won't see the same kind of digital images flashed around uh, the country, at least not yet, uh, and th the power of it, where we might, as a country, say, oh, I can't go for, you know, putting electric cords around people and shocking them everywhere, but I could go for this, because this sexual humiliation, this, you know, is very effective. And I think that there were also instructions about it from information that's beginning to come out about how effective it is and about how one can use it as an element of uh, humiliation and even interrogation. Uh, so I, but I don't know whether the prison system itself, and this is something I wanted to ask you, uh, whether they themselves, I'm going to use the word gain in any way from it. Is there some order that is imposed among the inmates themselves that helps the prisons be more, I'm, I'll say orderly, but this is my ignorance. I don't know, you know, what, do th can they get invested in this in a way that makes it even harder to stop it? Well, I think that there certainly is something to be gained by turning a blind eye to the situation. It's, it's not a question for a lot of correction staff of not knowing when the abuse is happening. We hear reports of 
screams in the night literally going unanswered. So there is a, a definitely uh, deliberate um, callousness to, to allowing this type of uh, abuse to flourish. And I think there are specific cases where officers have, have really encouraged it. So for example, there was one case in California known as the Booty Bandit case. It was called that because this one sexual predator was so notorious for raping other inmates that he was called the Booty Bandit by the staff and inmates alike. Mm -hmm. And Eddie Dillard, an inmate who um, kicked a corrections officer was uh, was punished for that behavior by being put by four other um, correction staff into a cell with the booty bandit and he was locked in with him uh, for over 24 hours where he was repeatedly raped. Um, he brought suit, a civil suit, um, and he didn't win so it wasn't proven but um, but it is one of the the many examples that we hear about of this this callousness on the the part of staff members to this type of abuse. Human Rights Watch did a, um, a, a report in 2001 called uh, No Escape Male Rape uh, in U.S. Prisons and uh, they mentioned uh, um, s several um, similar uh, cases of, of um, inmates who claim that uh, they were placed in a, in a, a situation and it was a, a, a scenario where um, the, the prison officials were using it for control or as a punishment and you know whether those cases are true or not it's certainly the number of cases that have been you know reported certainly raises the question the um, a, a number of people experience jail before they experience prison people are in jail awaiting their trials or sometimes even after sentencing uh, have to remain there until there's a transfer or a way for intake or you know to have a reception center mm -hmm. open up because I don't know about how New York is but in California it's jammed now I mean mm -hmm. we have an unslaking thirst in California for locking people mm -hmm. up and uh, enhancing crimes that, but that's another show uh, do you find the same or similar issues in the jails, in the county or local jails? Jails, because of their transient nature, can actually be more dangerous than prison scenarios. Um, just because there's a certain anonymity with so much movement. And um, I think that as Los Angeles has found out recently that- uh, Five murders. Five murders. Yes, um, exactly. So, um, I, I was actually warned when I went back to court um, uh, on, a, on a writ by the the a person who was my protector in prison to be very careful while I was in the county jail. Um, and uh, I had a, a couple of close calls while I was there. And, uh, well, they have a classification system. I'm sorry, Laura, did you want to? Oh, I was just going to add that? that there actually isn't any good data on the rates of rape um, in jails. It just is something that has been vastly understudied. But we do hear reports about um, abuse happening in jails. In fact, Tom Cahill, who's the president of our organization's board of directors, was gang raped in jail where he was being held for civil disobedience in Texas. Um, so there can be unimaginably terrible situations that happen in jail, and sometimes you know, even very recent cases that have made the news in, in Gainesville, Florida, there was a 21-year-old college student who was picked up uh, for marijuana possession and was, uh, was raped in jail. So, so those, those cases do happen, we just don't have solid numbers. But the classification process that some um, uh, uh, counties have picked up, Los Angeles does that, San Francisco has an excellent program, they do make a difference. I know in my case, when I was first sentenced and before I was transferred to the uh, State Department of Corrections, because I was 17, I had never um, been in jail before, they put me in a separate uh, cell block that was with other like um, uh, offenders. And uh, there was really no threat. I didn't feel um, really uh, that I was even in a dangerous setting. Yet when I came back to court on writ, because I was coming from the prison system, they just put me mm -hmm. um, in any cell. And it, it, my experience, it was the difference between night and day. Well, in, uh, it's interesting. It can be a good thing or a bad thing. There's been segregation of uh, identified and self-identified or identified by others, gay men, uh, in uh, a sort of an area with sexual predators, i.e. all gay men must be sexual predators, therefore we're putting them all together. And I've heard that some jails, not L.A., but some jails have done that. Uh, on the other hand, in L.A. County, um, the segregation for gay prisoners, if they spend enough time there, there's a whole class of prisoners that just graduated with their graduate uh, degree equivalent. 
um, and they had a graduation. It was quite you know, celebrated. They were felt that they'd really started on a new path because they'd been allowed to be safe. Um, so that gay men are safe with gay men, it seems. At least they feel safe. And mm -hmm. this sort of behavior didn't go on. Mm -hmm. So it sort of turns the myth on its head. Uh -huh. I think the classification model is, is a really important one and it's something that you know a lot of times people will ask us well, what can be done about prisoner rape isn't it just inevitable if you take a bunch of people who've committed crimes and put them together that this kind of thing will happen and you know really the classification system can be just a quick 10 minute interview on intake and it, a lot of it is just common sense you know not putting likely victims in with known sexual predators um, so it is something that facilities really should be doing and I think you know while we're talking about classification it's it's really important to men mention the situation for transgender prisoners because mm -hmm. that's been a real issue in terms of trying to understand where to house people and there have been terrible situations of um, people who are tra men transitioning to m male to female transsexual who have been put into to male prisons and have been taunted and harassed and have been forced to walk, um, you know, bare-chested like everybody else um, to, you know, take in their laundry, for example, and it really extreme situations like that, and, and then you know, ranging all the way up to to much worse situations, including um, including rape. So, uh, the, you know, the there is one. Um, Supreme Court case that deals with prisoner rape, and that's Farmer versus Brennan. And actually, this month is the 10-year anniversary of that decision. And and D. Farmer um, was a transgender inmate who was raped, and that was the case that that made it to the Supreme Court. And the court found that in fact, rape in prison is a violation of the Eighth Amendment's prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. But I think that the situation of transgender prisoners is one that needs much more attention. So it's cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> For transgender persons? For or anyone. Rape for per anyone. Se? Um, well, the standard is deliberate indifference. Mm. So um, in order for a case to be successful, the inmate would have to prove that officials were deliberately indifferent to their situation. Now, that's a problematic standard because it, uh, it incentivizes the staff to be ignorant, to not mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. um, about what's going on. Um, so it's a problem for that reason, but it's still important um, in terms of acknowledging that the level of harm is, is cruel and unusual. Mm -hmm. Well, I think for, for gay prisoners um, uh, and, and for the gay community, I think, as a whole, um, should be offended and outraged by the, even the, uh, the notion that uh, the gays are, are, are being segregated because they're the predators when, in fact, they are the ones that are victimized. Um, if you're gay and you're going to prison, you have to hook up or lock up. Um, it's just the way prison is. And so then to add insult to injury to be then laid the blame for this uh, situation is just, it's really appalling. And I think that, again, that goes to the, uh, you know, the, the shame and the stigma that inmates carry. And you mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the segregation that goes on in L.A., um, for example. Um, you know, the, the gay prisoners who are isolated and were given some opportunities to get some education, I think, you know, I read that their recidivism rate was actually a Much third lower. of what it was right. for their straight counterparts. So That's right. Of course, we also found that with uh, things like uh, learning to read, you know, and any kind of help in surviving because most of our prison population is going to return to society. Mm -hmm. And in most of the states, we do nothing about preparing them to do that or even helping them to exist on the outside. Um, some succeed fine and some just, you know, can't pick up the threads of their lives again. And so this, talk about cruel and unusual punishment. I mean, I, we've done a study and had some testimony about women particularly because they are the ones that overwhelmingly have custody of children. But a large percentage of our female population in California in prison have children under the age of six. And many of them don't know where they are, don't know how they ended up because there's no real attention paid to what happens to the children officially uh, it sort of just drifts. And I always felt like that was an extra punishment. You have a kid, you get an extra punishment in addition to your, you know, to your time. This uh, experience of rape in prison to me seems the same. It's an extra, not only a cruel and unusual punishment, but an, like an extra sentence. Mm -hmm. That you yeah, and I have. think it's also important to mention the issue of HIV rates in prison. Um, we know that uh, HIV rates are five to ten times as high inside of prison as they are outside of prison, and obviously, um, you know, forced 
anal sex is a very high risk behavior. There isn't good data about the rates of transmission, but we do work with survivors who have contracted HIV as a result of their time in prison. Keith de Blasio, mm -hmm. uh, who TJ knows is a, is a gay inmate who was sentenced for a nonviolent securities offense and contracted HIV and is now outside but, but living with the disease. And he talks about it as, as really a life sentence in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, a death sentence. I mean, maybe not these days with uh, with good drugs and the ability to live longer, but still something. The quality that of life isn't very very good. No, of yeah. course not. Well, actually, one of the past presidents of Stop Prisoner Rape did die as a result of AIDS that he contracted through prisoner rape, and that was his name was Stephen Donaldson, and he died in 1996. Well, so I'm sure interested in what got cases. you into this work too. I mean, I, I guess we can yeah. we hear TJ's story. We understand sure. this is a personal story to him. Sure. Well, my background is working on uh, reproductive rights and sexual violence issues internationally. And I, I had always been drawn to international work because I felt that there were so many examples of the need being so dire. But when I learned about Stop Prisoner Rape and the work that it was doing on, on an issue that was so vastly common and yet really neglected, I, I found it to be compelling. So, um, so I first joined the organization's board of directors and later applied for the job of executive director. But I'm, I'm a human rights lawyer, and, and that's the perspective that I try to bring to the organization as one of, of human rights. And we talk about, uh, you know, our tagline is, is safety, dignity, and, and human rights for all. Well, the... Um Though the audience of this show is not overwhelmingly gay and lesbian because people sort of get caught up by it and stop and, you know, watch, still there are a good many people in our community that watch it. And so let me ask you for a moment about the potential involvement of the, the gay and lesbian communities and the movement in this issue. I mean, it doesn't seem as though it's kind of caught on as, uh, and I don't, criticize everybody's kind of got their own set of issues but have you found that the community's been at all interested in this issue because it's not a gay issue although it impacts gay men in prison no question about it right well I think I think it is a gay issue I when we were in Washington last year lobbying for the prison rape elimination act I was personally um, puzzled and pained by the absence of the gay community mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know our community has been involved in adoption and uh, gay marriage and hate crimes, which are all important. But um, uh, the way in which gays are, 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 are disproportionately victimized, if that alone isn't enough to um, uh, engender the community's support, you know, being laid the blame for it, I think ought to be. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I just you know find that offensive. But I think it's a human rights issue that should go across all. Uh, sexualities. Um, uh, you know, this is just an appalling situation that's going on. And you know, in World War II, the uh, the Nazis, you know, dehumanized uh, 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 their victims uh, because they were in an inferior race or religion. And uh, I think that uh, this hatred is is really at the core here. And I think it's very similar to the hatred that we're seeing over in Iraq. I think even today, with all of these pictures, there's still. Um, a fair amount of Americans who are probably saying they're terrorists and probably deserved it. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's a dehumanization. It's, and uh, it's just, it's awful. Well, what, uh, what do you call on people to do with, uh, through the organization? I mean, is there a way of becoming involved, becoming interested? I mean, obviously there's uh, education, which is part of what we're doing mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, but what other things do you engage in in terms of trying to get people to pay attention to this. I like the fact that you're in Congress and, you know, going for legislation. I I personally believe in that, of mm -hmm. course, as you might imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what else? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, I, I would just second what TJ said about this this being a gay issue. I do think it's undeniable just from from my perspective and, and hearing, you know, just the survivors that write to us and the, the vast quantity of mail that we get uh, from prisoners and how many of them are uh, gay. It's just, I think it, it really is a gay issue. But I also uh, believe that it is something that is so appalling and so dehumanizing and so widespread that everybody should be alarmed. I think that, that we as a nation should be as alarmed uh, about what's happening in our prisons as, as we were as a nation when we saw the pictures coming out of Iraq. Um, and in terms of people getting involved, I think the first thing to do would be to visit our website where it's very easy to join our listserv. Um, our website is www.spr, for Stop Prisoner Rape, .org. And on the homepage, um, you can join the listserv. And the, the listserv is a, a great way to keep involved. Um, and, and we 
send up to the minute news reports. We give opportunities for activism. We're getting ready to launch a campaign that will be um, an Amnesty International style campaign focused on one survivor and, and seeking relief for that one person. Mm. Um, and of course, donating money is always a way to, to help the cause too. Of course. <laughs> and are there ways that activists can get involved as well? Um, I understand visiting the website gets you there. But what kinds of things could people do, in addition to giving money, which is always a very good thing, uh, what other things might people be called upon to do? Well, I think in terms of, of other activists, it's certainly something that we're, we're working on. We are working to mobilize activists, especially in the LGBT community. I think there is a, a lack of attention to this issue in that community, and that's um, some of the work that we're, we're starting to do in earnest. And uh, the other thing that we try to do is to build bridges among uh, different organizations and get them to pay attention to this population. So rape crisis centers, for example, just mm -hmm. in a state of California, there are 92 rape crisis centers. So these are, this is a tremendously vast right. resource and a lot of them have in their missions that they um, want to reach underserved or marginalized communities and it, it doesn't get much more marginalized than people who are raped in prison. So we're encouraging those organizations through trainings and outreach to open their doors to people in prison um, and a lot of them are beginning to do so. We started a survivor resource guide and, and it's nationwide so anyone with a rape crisis organization or a legal aid group or any other type of mental health resource that's willing to open their doors uh, to prisoner rape survivors should contact us and, and uh, see about being listed in the guide. Well, we'll put the, uh, the website up uh, under our credits. Right? Great, great. One uh, closing thought? Yeah, I, I would say also that for uh, members of our community, the, the um, uh, gay and lesbian community, the, the isolation for gay inmates inside of prison is, is um, very intense. And I think that one of the things, one of the things that was credited for the results that they're getting out of the Los Angeles program in the county jail there is that one component is that they, they work with the identity and the self-esteem of these prisoners, which has an effect on their being able to rise above uh, those circumstances. So, you know, I think that on, a, on an individual level, there's ways in which you could uh, contact uh, gay prisoners. And uh, again, by getting involved and, and uh, writing your local um, uh, lawmakers to, um, you know, address this issue is another way. Great. Well, our hour is up. I told you it went by fast. <laughs> um, thank you so much, thank both you. of you, very much for the thank information, you. for being here, for the good work that you're doing. Thank you for watching, too. Um, this is an issue I bet you haven't thought about very much in terms of prisoner rape, sexual humiliation in prisons. And I guess I would have to say, unusually for my tagline, in this case, don't get used to it.